Hi, everybody. My name is David Allen Hall. I'm a novelist and independent radio producer. And today I want to talk to you about developing your own style, your own particular manner of expression. Now, there's three components involved in this process. The quality of your thought, that's what you have to say. The particular manner of expression, that's how you personally say it. And the interpretation of that expression, how someone perceives you. We're going to focus on the first two, quality of thought and particular manner of expression. Nurturing these two skills will help you whether you write fiction, nonfiction, speeches, letters. It'll help you in your interpersonal relationships, in your career. It's just very valuable. Now, I want to do this by examining a great piece of writing, the Gettysburg Address. You might say, Gettysburg Address? Why that? It's not fiction. It's old. We had to memorize that in grade school. Well, all of that's true, but it's a great piece of writing, and it's short enough for us to get a handle on it. Because of the brief time we have today, I'm going to try something untraditional. Not only am I going to analyze the speech, so you can see how Lincoln uses certain tools like time, imagery, how he grounds abstract ideas and creates transcendence. All these things can help you with your writing. But more than that, I want to show you how I developed my own quality of thought to do this lecture. And by doing that, I hope to give you some ideas to generate and start nurturing your own quality of thought. I'm going to discuss where I got the information for this lecture how I form my facts. I'm going to give you some historical background. I'm going to give you a context so you can better understand why this speech was written. Then I'm going to read the speech. I'm going to analyze it line by line, all 272 words of this brief, clear, progressive, great piece of writing. I don't think there are any hard and fast rules in writing, but if I were forced to come up with two, I think being clear and using the fewest words possible to make a point are good ones to start with. Lincoln does this very well. After I analyze the speech, I'm going to discuss some criticism of it. Then I'm going to read it a second time. And if I'm successful in my presentation today, you will hear the speech in an entirely different way at the end than you do at the beginning. My ultimate goal for this lecture is to give you some tools to develop your own style, your quality of thought, and the way you express that thought. There are those who say, and I happen to agree with them, that there are no new thoughts. There are only new expressions. And this is what's important. Do you ever wonder where history professors or instructors or guest speakers like myself get their info? I mean, I'm standing up here lecturing. You know, where did I get my info? I wasn't living in 1863 when Lincoln wrote and gave this speech. Well, professors go to school for half their lives. I mean, they're constantly doing research and publishing. As a writer, I am too. I'm constantly doing research and publishing, but in a different way. Before I prepared this lecture to give to you today, I had certain preconceptions about the Gettysburg Address that I had heard through the years, saw in documentaries on television. For example, I thought Lincoln just wrote one speech that that was it, there was one version. I used to think that his invitation to speak that day was kind of an afterthought. I used to think Lincoln wrote the address on the train going to Gettysburg. I used to think the one photograph we have of Lincoln was taken after he gave the speech. And I used to think people didn't like the speech much at the time. Now, I heard these things through the years on television documentaries. But you have to understand, the job of television is also to entertain. And sometimes, like newspapers often do, they print the negative or the sensational aspect of a particular point of information simply to make it more interesting. So what if I came up here today and just parroted what I had heard on TV all these years? Well, not only would I be cheating you it wouldn't be my own quality of thought. I hadn't thought about it. And it certainly wouldn't be my expression. I would just be copying what I heard other people say. So how did I 
form my own quality of thought for this lecture. What did I do? Well, I went back to the original sources. And this is really easy these days. You guys have it so much easier than I did when I was your age. Because all you have to do is go to the computer and type in Gettysburg Address. And you will get a list of all these links, hundreds and hundreds of them. Now, I focused on the Library of Congress, on the original manuscript. I looked at eyewitness accounts of the time. I looked at the letter that invited Lincoln to speak at the address. I looked at a reporter's transcript of the speech he made in shorthand as Lincoln gave it. I compared it to the original draft Lincoln wrote. These sources of information helped me better make judgments, and that's, that's what they are. Their interpretations of the sources. How well can I defend those interpretations? And how do I particularly express them in my own unique way to help you better learn? Now, you might be saying, well, that's great, Mr. Hall, but I want to write a novel. I want to write fiction. What does that have to do with creative writing? Well, it has everything to do with creative writing. You know how I said, well, I could just parrot what I heard on TV? Well, let's say you like detective novels, and you read them, and you go to write a detective novel. Now, are you just going to combine all the stuff you've read about detective novels into your own detective novel? Or are you going to think for yourself? You have the same choice I had. Either parrot something you've heard or create your own thoughts and expressions. It's the same thing. Now, one of the problems I had when I started researching this lecture was the discovery that there were five different manuscript copies of the Gettysburg Address. That is, Lincoln had handwritten five different copies. And they have small discrepancies. So which one should I read to you? Well, Lincoln gave one of these to each of his two private secretaries, John Nicolay and John Hay. The Nicolay copy is often referred to as the first draft because it's believed to be the earliest copy that exists. But when I checked into it, it's unclear whether or not this was the reading copy, the copy that Lincoln read that day. In 1894, Nicolay wrote that Lincoln had brought with him the first page of the speech, written in ink on Executive Mansion stationery, you know, the White House stationery, and that he had written the second page in pencil on line paper just before the dedication. Now, probably he wrote it the night before at the house where he stayed. Scholars point to matching folds on these two sheets as evidence that this was the copy that eyewitnesses say they saw Lincoln take from his pocket at the ceremony and read. But if that's true, then why are there words and phrases missing on that copy? The words, for example, under God are missing from the phrase that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. So in order for that copy to be the copy Lincoln read, he would have had to insert spontaneously as he read certain words into the text. There was a reporter there who took down shorthand of what Lincoln said, and his copy has these words in it. So the mystery remains. The question for my mind is, how credible is this journalist's shorthand? You know, it's like one time I remember the Smithsonian exhibit was in town and I wanted to go see Lincoln's top hat. They had Lincoln's top hat. How do I really know that's Lincoln's top hat? There's no way they can prove it. And ultimately, you either have faith in the credibility of the Smithsonian Institution to maintain a chain of custody, or you don't. So these are the questions that help you form your own quality of thought. This is where you separate yourself from other people. How well can you make your argument? I'm proceeding with the argument that the copy that the journalist wrote in shorthand that day is the copy, or the words rather, that Lincoln spoke. That's what I'm going to read to you. Now, when Lincoln returned back to Washington after the address, he made several other copies. Uh, these were for charitable purposes. He gave one to Edward Everett, the orator who spoke at Gettysburg for two hours before Lincoln. This copy can be found in the historical library at Springfield. He gave a copy to the historian George Bancroft, 
This copy can be found at Cornell and to Bancroft's stepson, Alexander Bliss. The Bliss copy is now in the Lincoln Room at the White House. And this is really neat. In order to assure the long-term preservation of these drafts of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, they manufactured state-of-the-art environmental containers for each document. In addition, the Library of Congress constructed a low-temperature vault where these containers and their other top treasures of the library are permanently stored. Now, these containers are constructed of heavy-gauge stainless steel. They have inner supports and two outer frames joined with gaskets and bolts, and this allows for viewing from both sides. The containers are filled with low-moisture argon gas, and what this does is purge the environment inside the container of oxygen, thereby virtually eliminating deterioration from oxidation, including photooxidation. Now these containers are sealed and conditioned to 49.5 degrees Fahrenheit with a condition of 49% relative humidity inside. Even if the documents weren't sealed in argon, the constant low temperature inside the case effectively quadruples the lifespan of these documents. Now, why is it so important? What's the big deal about the Gettysburg Address? Well, in addition to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, along with the Emancipation Proclamation, they're the most important documents in the history of our country. So I'm going to give you some background, some context to why this speech was written before I recited to you. I'll go back just to the point when we separated from Britain, when the American colonies separated from Britain. They weren't happy with the leadership over there. They thought it was tyrannical. They felt like they were under a centralized government. They couldn't do the things they wanted to do, so they came over to the United States. And then uh, Britain started trying to control them over here. So they declared they were independent. And the Declaration of Independence says, we are a free nation. This is why we are leaving, because of the way you're treating us. And these 13 states are independent. So we fought the British. We beat them. To establish a government, we designed a constitution. These were the laws by which we would live. Basically, we broke up power into the three branches. But written into the constitution was slavery. At the time, the North said, look, we need to get rid of slavery. And the South wouldn't agree to it. The Civil War happened because the founders couldn't solve two problems at the ratifying convention for the Constitution. One, states' rights. Is your loyalty to the state you live in or to the central government? And two, the issue of slavery. The Confederates seceded because they believed when Lincoln was elected that this tyrant was going to take away their liberties and force their way of life on the South. The South wanted to keep their slaves. So the war broke out. Lincoln is fighting the war to keep the Union together. The Confederates are fighting the war because they feel like, hey, we're being oppressed. You're trying to tell us how to live. The issue of slavery just happened to be the igniting issue. Well, the war went on for several years. Then, in the summer of 63, it came to a head in Gettysburg. On the first day, the Confederates pushed the Army of the Potomac back, but they pushed them back onto a ring of hills, and the Federals stretched out in a long line. The second day of fighting, Lee attacked both flanks, both ends, and he almost broke through. It was close. On the third day of fighting, Lee figured, look, They've reinforced the ends where we hit them yesterday. I want to send everybody we have fresh right into the middle. We'll break their line. It was an insane idea. Lee was, his blood was up. He thought he was unbeatable. It utterly failed. There was a tremendous loss of life. Uh, the South retreated back across the Potomac. Now, there were just thousands of bodies left there in the field. The civilians and the wounded soldiers left behind did their best to bury the dead under a thin layer of earth. 
but eventually, you know, relatives would come out, dig around, trying to see if it was their son that was dead. One day, Governor Curtin, governor of Pennsylvania, was touring the battlefield. He was outraged that the Union boys were just lying there. I mean, vultures were picking at their flesh. So Curtin charged Wills, David Wills, a successful local citizen and judge, with cleaning up this horrible mess. I mean, the wounded soldiers were crammed in every available building. Thousands of swollen dead were strewn among hundreds of bloated dead horses just right out there. An interstate commission was formed to raise funds to support the cemetery. And the War Department said, yeah, we'll send the caskets. So they figured, let's dedicate this place, and then we'll rebury the dead. Well, the custom of the day required a ceremony, an oration. And on September 23rd, David Wills invited the venerable Edward Everett, the nation's foremost rhetorician, to come out and give an oration to dedicate the ceremony. This was planned for October 23rd. Now, Everett accepted, but he said he needed more time, and he persuaded Wills to postpone the ceremony to November 19th. Now we come to this business about Lincoln being invited as an afterthought. You know, well, they said, well, should we invite him or not? I don't know. He might embarrass us. He tells jokes. That's all basically he does. They said, okay, well, we'll invite him, and maybe he won't come. Well, when I did research for this lecture, I found that was not really true. On November 2nd, 1863, David Wills invited President Lincoln to come and make a few appropriate remarks. Now, although Wills wrote the invitation to Lincoln only about three weeks prior to the dedication, there's evidence that Lincoln was fully apprised of this affair early in October. Furthermore, Will's invitation included a warm welcome to the president to stay at his house, along with Everett and Curtin. I'd just like to read briefly from the letter that David Wills wrote Lincoln to invite him. He said, It will be a source of great gratification to the many widows and orphans that have been made almost friendless by the great battle here to have you here personally and it will kindle anew in the breasts of comrades of these brave dead who are now in the tented field or nobly meeting the foe in the front, a confidence that they who sleep in death on the battlefield are not forgotten by those highest in authority, and they will feel that, should their fate be the same, their remains will not be uncared for. I think Lincoln was invited with a great deal of respect. Now, Lincoln, you have to remember, only had one year of formal education. He was born into poverty. He educated himself by reading. He read Plutarch's Lives, Noah Webster, Shakespeare, the King James Bible. In all his life, Lincoln questioned how a nation could be founded in liberty and yet have slavery. Now, this idea that Lincoln wrote the address on the train coming up is, is nonsense. Uh, in those days, the trains were so bumpy, there's no way he could have. He wrote the first page at the White House, like Nicolay said, and then the second page that night at David Will's house. In the morning, Lincoln left the town square and rode out to the battlefield with the procession. Now on this morning, Lincoln was tired. He looked ungainly on a horse too small for him. He sat slumped in the saddle. The pressures of the war, the mounting debt, pushed against him. Add to that, Mrs. Lincoln had just learned that her beloved brother Ben, like her other two brothers, had died serving the Confederacy, Lincoln's very opponent in this war. And she was worried about their ill child. The doctors had assured her the fever would pass, but the doctors had said the same thing before about their other son who had died. So with all this on his mind, Lincoln arrived now, I looked carefully at the photograph we have that day. The only image I had ever seen was a cropped image of Lincoln. But I got to see the whole photograph. And it's a wide shot of the crowd. And if you look at the shadows on that photo, it's taken about noontime. We know from someone there that Lincoln didn't speak till around 3 or 4 in the afternoon. 
and we know Everett spoke for two hours before Lincoln. So this photograph had to be taken before he gave the speech, not right after. You know, there's this story about Lincoln got up, the cameraman was fumbling around, thought he had plenty of time, and the speech was so short that by the time Lincoln sat back down, the cameraman wasn't even ready and uh, only managed to get this blurred shot of Lincoln. Now, Lincoln arrived before Everett that day, and when Everett showed up, he engaged in a rhetorical depiction of the battle, and he recreated it, I think, masterfully. Again, when I was researching for this lecture, I read Everett's speech, and uh, it's long, but it's really good. It's entertaining, and if you're a Civil War buff, I suggest that you read it. I think you'll find it's better than what you've been led to believe. The crowd loved it. They felt like they got their money's worth. There was a brief musical interlude, and then Lincoln got up to speak. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln sat back down. Some in the crowd were laughing. Others didn't even know that had been the president speaking. Lincoln turned to a friend of his who was sitting next to him and said, that speech won't scowl. And uh, he was talking about a plow. That's what you said when a plow would no longer cut the earth. That plow won't scowl. Uh, what Lincoln didn't know was that the reason the crowd was laughing was because of the cameraman. Remember I'd mentioned the cameraman earlier? He was fumbling around trying to get a picture, and the crowd was laughing at him because Lincoln's speech had been so short he hadn't been able to. Now, the myth that no one liked the speech at the time simply isn't true. Edward Everett wrote Lincoln a complimentary letter. He said something to the effect, Mr. President, I wish I could flatter myself that I had come as close to the heart of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. Lincoln wrote him back and said, thanks, we each had our job to do. You did a good job. Now, I checked some of the reviews of the speech at the time. They ran along party lines. You know, Lincoln's party liked it. The other party didn't. I want to talk about the speech. I want to make some, you know, broad comments about the speech before I do a an in-depth analysis. Remember when I talked about the three things we were going to focus on? Quality of thought, particular manner of expression, and interpretation of that expression. When I do my analysis, that's the interpretation portion. Now as a writer, you don't have a lot of control over how someone interprets your work, but the better you are at the quality of your thought and the way you express it, the more accurate their interpretation is going to be in terms of what you intended, we hope. Now the speech, it's interesting. The only reference to the battle is what they did here. 
that's what Everett spent two hours on. Lincoln spent four words on it. Nothing really ties the speech to the occasion. He does say we are met on a great battlefield. And the word here appears again and again in this text. It's almost as if Lincoln is trying to locate where they're at without saying it. It's a highly abstract piece focused on a larger meaning. And in this way, Lincoln's words are remembered long after the details of the battle are forgotten. I mean, if you're not a Civil War buff, I bet you can't tell me any details of the Battle of Gettysburg. But you do know, probably, at least some of the speech from your youth. This is what we remember. Now, Lincoln acknowledges why the speech is given. He says, it's altogether fitting and proper that we should you know, do this, dedicate this cemetery. But then he says, the soldiers' actions are far more important. Their actions speak louder than our words. And in this way, Lincoln transcends the genre of dedication. How can we interpret this speech? How can this speech be read? Well, you can read it that the Federals made a good fight of it. They pushed the rebels back, and now the work can be finished. The work of strictly military campaign. You could read it that way, but if you do read it that way, the speech has very little value after the war ends. Another reading could be that the task, Lincoln says, is before us, is that to restore the Union. You know, when the South had seceded, it had broke the Union in two. These sides were fighting. We are here to restore the Union. But ultimately, I read it as looking toward the future. Lincoln focuses not on what happened, but what it meant and what it still means. It has a timeless quality, a transcendence, that makes the writing still relevant today, which I will speak more of in a few minutes. Now, as I analyze this line by line and word by word, you might be thinking, oh, God, this, this guy's full of crap. Lincoln didn't mean that. Where's this guy getting this? I mean, I can remember when I was in English class and professors would analyze short stories and novels, and I'd be saying the same thing. I just didn't understand where were they getting all this deep symbolism from. Lincoln loved to read Shakespeare. And even now, I can look at the criticism of Othello. It changed from the 17th to the 18th to the 19th to the 20th century, depending on the times. The criticism changes. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm speaking from my own point of view, my own quality of thought, and I'm going to try to back up my points in the way I express myself. If you disagree, then do so with some thought. Back up your disagreements with specifics. Why do you think I'm full of it? That's why I'm here today. This is what writers do. They think for themselves. They generate new expressions of old ideas. I'm going to talk in my analysis some general points of language. I'm going to look at Lincoln's use of time, his use of biblical imagery, his use of familial imagery, and his use of birth imagery. I'm going to show how he grounds abstract ideas by using references to specifics, and he generates a transcendence through these abstract ideas that makes this a great piece of writing. So here we go. Now you have your handouts of the speech. Follow along as I go line by line, word by word. Four score and seven years ago. This is a great opening. It's a novel opening. I mean, it's so much better than... What if he had said, in 1776, or 87 years ago? By saying four score and seven years ago, he engages you. He makes you, first of all, figure out how long ago that was. But mainly, he's talking about the past. He starts in the past, just long enough to be beyond the living memory of those who were there that day. He's saying, our country has outlived the lifespan of a normal person, because in 1776, He's talking about the Declaration of Independence, the birth of freedom, of self-determination. He's also evoking the Bible here. The Bible says the life of a man is three score years and ten, or by den of strength, four score years. Lincoln's putting the Bible in our heads, so let's keep it there as we move along. This is a Christian speech 
to a Christian audience. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth. This is poetry. It scans. It alliterates. It assonates. It resonates. The alliteration? Four fathers forth. The assonance? Four or. Score or. Fathers forth. It's a kind of bracketing of sound and sense, but also a bracketing that shadows the forefathers. He doesn't say forefathers, but he has the sound of four in the back of our mind. Fathers. This is familial imagery. He's saying these are our fathers. We are a family. We are descendants of them. We have a blood responsibility to carry on the line. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth. Brought forth. This is birth imagery, like the delivery of a baby. From an old life comes a new life. I think of the line, And Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. Brought forth. Birth is painful, but it's worth the pain for a fresh life, a new start. Brought forth on this continent a new nation. Now, this is not new like a new pair of shoes, but something unique, something that has never existed before. A new nation conceived. Again, birth imagery is the conception of a birth. Well, what is this birth conceived in? It's conceived by liberty. This is what gave it life. Liberty, freedom enjoined with morality. This time, we are going to do what is right. Conceived in liberty and dedicated. I think Lincoln is saying we are dedicated to a proposition. Now, the word proposition, this is not a fact. This is something that's proposed. We're going to test it. It's proposed that all men are created equal. Now, this is the first self-evident truth of the Declaration. Look at this abstract idea. All men are created equal. Lincoln grounds it in the Declaration of Independence. For Lincoln, freedom and equality transcend even the Constitution. He uses this, all men are created equal, as a proposition to be advanced. The nation is born again, a new birth conceived in liberty, to pursue this principle. This is what your sons have died for. This is a very high cause. This proposition will be tested over time through the experience of the country. Now we are engaged in a great civil war. We also move forward in time. We went from the past, four score and seven years ago. Now we are in the present. Now we are engaged in a great civil war. Testing. That's what this war is. It's a test to see if these ideas can survive. Testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. You have the birth imagery again. But in that one sentence, more importantly, Lincoln tells the people why they are fighting. Why we have pitted American against American. Why we are killing each other in our own fields, around our own houses, destroying our own cities. We are fighting this war so that this nation will live. And if we do not fight and we do not win, then something special will pass from this earth. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. Now, I can just see an English teacher, Lincoln, sitting in class. Excuse me, Mr. Lincoln, um, you used the word great twice in the same area, the same general area. You need to find another word. You can't use great twice. Well... This is not the place for variety, but for truth. These are great things. We are engaged in a great civil war. We are met on a great battlefield. This sentence, we are met on a great battlefield, also changes pace. We've come from some longer sentences. Now we have a nice shorter sentence to break up and give variety. So we do have variety here, even though it's not variety of adjectives. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. 
Remember when I read the letter David Will sent to Lincoln to invite him? He talked about being a comfort to widows and so forth. In this one sentence, Lincoln has told the grieving mothers and fathers, the widows, the children left without a father, why their fathers have given their lives. And he evokes the great mystery of Christianity, that God would send his son into the world to suffer and die, so that all men might find salvation. I think of those verses in the Battle Hymn of the Republic. They go something like, In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. This is what Lincoln's talking about. There's a deep conviction here. The speech continues. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. Let's look at some of these words. Dedicate. Consecrate. Hallow. These are religious words. Remember how Lincoln evoked the Bible early? Well, we are in the thick of it now. You dedicate a church. You consecrate a shrine. He is imbuing this struggle with the sanctity of religion. A religious war, that's what this is, fought for the noblest of principles. Also, if you look at the original handwritten manuscript in these couple of sentences, you can see where Lincoln inserted a carrot and wrote poor between the words are and power. It originally read, have consecrated it far above our power to add or detract. Look at what the insertion of a great adjective can do here. Have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. It's almost oxymoronic. It doesn't seem to fit. How can power be poor? Well, I'd like to suggest that power can be poor because Lincoln places himself and his government beneath a higher power, a spiritual power, from which through death, a new, higher life can come. Again, Lincoln takes the back seat to what's really important here with this one great adjective, and it alliterates, it assonates. This is just good writing, and the good writing goes on. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, this line always cracks me up. I mean, here we are devoting a whole lecture to what Lincoln said. Whole books have been devoted to this. So uh, Abe was wrong about this point. But it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. Now, we're getting into the real power of the speech. It has a transformative impact. It changes the way we think about things. Dedicate appears in this text six times. Dedicate, the Latin, de dicere. I always wanted to stand up in front of a class and start spewing Latin. I think that's cool. <laughs> de dicere, the Latin to speak about, or in the presence of, or before. This address plays out the etymology of the word dedicate. Lincoln uses the word dedicate in two different ways. He changes the way we think about it. First he says, we can't dedicate this ground. It's already been done by the men who fought here. Then he says, it's rather for us to be dedicated. This comes clearly from the ancient Greek tradition of praise for the dead and advice for the living in a eulogy. Lincoln first uses the word dedicate to honor the dead. The second time he uses it is to motivate us in the challenge of completing the work. Well, what's the challenge? Lincoln doesn't say what the challenge is. He only alludes to its outcome. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. What more can anyone do than die for their country? Patton would say at the beginning of the movie, they can make the other poor guy die for his country. 
But this is a good point. What more can you do? The great Pericles, who was responsible for putting together the Athenian democracy, he evoked this theme in his funeral oration. Now Lincoln knew about this. It was part of a book of rhetoric he'd studied when he was educating himself. From when I talked about the ancient Greek tradition of praise for the dead and advice for the living, this is it. Pericles said, each of these men may have had their faults, but when their supreme moment came, they stood true in the line of battle, and they wrapped themselves in a mantle of glory that can never fade. Now Lincoln pays this tribute to these men. You have to remember, this was a war in which the government didn't directly notify the loved ones of those who had been killed. Often, before one of these uh, charges that never should have been made, when these generals would just order these lines of men to walk out in the field and be mown down, these soldiers knew what was coming. If you were walking around the camp at that time, you could see them scribbling their names on, on paper and you know, tying them to the back under their shirt. So after they were killed, they would know who it was. Often, they would pay an embalmer up front to find their body. But for most... Word never came, and a plate set at a table for a son, and that son would never come home. But now they knew why their boy had died. Lincoln had told them, and their son had become, with all his faults, like a little Christ who had died so others might live. The essential Christian idea. Jesus had died to set other men free. This is what your son has done. This is the real power of the speech. Like I said before, it's transformative impact. It changes the way we think. Uh, here's another great line as I continue. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. Now this is fantastic. He's saying this government will have a new birth. The first birth was flawed. The Constitution was flawed because it carried with it the evil of slavery. And all this birth imagery he's used before, now we're having a new birth. We're going to get it right this time, under God. We have died of our animal nature and have been reborn of the spirit of a higher nature. We will not have slavery. Now, the scholar James M. McPherson, he calls this the second American Revolution. Now, he says, these men who fought and died for the Union, their work was done. They'd made the supreme sacrifice, and now it was up to the living to carry on the task. But Lincoln's rhetoric, as subsequent generations would discover, did far more than memorialize the dead. It transformed the meaning of the Constitution for those still alive. Lincoln read into the Constitution a promise of equality, the proposition that all men are created equal. Now this, of course, had been the premise of the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution. But everyone understood that the drafters of that document had not intended to include slaves or other, quote, inferior peoples in their definition. Now the country had fought a great war to test that notion. And the lives of the men who died at Gettysburg could be hallowed only that one way. If the nation finally lived up to the proposition that all of its people, regardless of race, were equal. The power of this idea still informs American democratic thought. And to conclude the speech, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. We have a special place among nations. And this also concludes Lincoln's use of time. We went from the past in the beginning with four score and seven to the present. We are now engaged. Now we are talking about the future. Now, Lincoln would die on Good Friday. His life as a testimony to his belief that from out of death, a new birth of freedom would come. It would be more than a hundred years before that vision of freedom was realized, and we are still struggling with it today. But there's no question that Lincoln is responsible in a large degree 
for setting us on the course that we're still traveling today. Now, I think I've made a pretty good argument here for some of this stuff, but let's look at some criticism of this speech, particularly by H.L. Mencken. Here's what Mencken had to say about the Gettysburg Address. He admits the Gettysburg speech was at once the shortest and the most famous oration in American history. The highest emotion reduced to a few poetical phrases. Lincoln himself never even remotely approached it. I'm not sure what he meant by that. It is a genuinely stupendous speech. But let us not forget that it is poetry, not logic. Beauty, not sense. Think of the argument in it. Put it into the cold words of every day. By the way, Mencken used every day wrong. It should be two words there, not one. The doctrine is simply this, that the Union soldiers who died at Gettysburg sacrificed their lives to the cause of self-determination. The government of the people, by the people, for the people should not perish from the earth. It is difficult to imagine, Mencken argues, anything more untrue. The Union soldiers in the battle actually fought against self-determination. It was the Confederates who fought for the right of their people to govern themselves. Wow. Now, has Mencken just destroyed everything I've just proposed? He makes a good argument here. He says, my quality of thought isn't right. I'm saying, and Lincoln's saying, that these Union boys are fighting for freedom, for the right to govern themselves. Mencken makes the point here. No, the Union boys are trying to impose their will on the Confederates. The whole reason the Confederates are fighting is because they couldn't determine their own future, that they couldn't decide for themselves whether or not they wanted slaves. Now, this is my whole point. Anytime you come up with a quality of thought or something that you feel strongly in, someone somewhere is going to come out of nowhere and try to shoot you down. It's like when you're in court and you hear one attorney argue and you go, oh yeah, that guy's guilty. Then you hear the other attorney get up and you go, oh wow, he is not guilty. This is what you have to learn to do. In the face of criticism, you have three choices. You can either say, no, you're wrong, and back up your point with a detailed argument, a system of belief that proves you're right. Or you can, and this is the tricky part, you can grow and acknowledge, yes, I must have a flexible system of belief and acknowledge I hadn't considered that point and integrate that point into your thinking. Or you can do the third option, which is just ignore it and not even question it, and that's bad. Writers who do that don't get very far. I'm going to challenge Mencken here because I don't think he's right. This is typical Mencken. It's like Socrates taking the opposite view, just trying to get people to think about things. He's a poor man, Socrates. Mencken saying the Union soldiers in the battle actually fought against self-determination. This is nonsense. The Confederates weren't fighting to govern themselves. The Confederates were fighting to enslave other men. The Union soldiers were fighting in the end to say no. Lincoln would say Rome and Greece and Cicero, they're wrong about slavery. It can't be justified. It's an abomination to God. And Mencken is just dead wrong here. I also get a kick out of Mencken. He, he will say things like, you know, uh, well, the Gettysburg Address, uh, so much esteemed, uh, this elegant benediction over the dead, this is not a specimen of Lincoln's new style, but, quote, an evidence of literary stage fright on a great occasion. He claims many of the phrases in the speech, such as four score and seven years ago, final resting place, honor dead, and so on, uh, Lincoln stole them. They belong to the age of Webster. This is simply old poetry in a new situation. Again, I disagree with Mencken. I mean, he's right. This is old poetry in a new situation. But what isn't? The King James Bible is the same thing. It's old poetry in a new situation. Anyone who studies Shakespeare knows 
Shakespeare ripped off practically every story he wrote. He took a quality of thought that wasn't new, and he self-expressed it, had a particular manner of expression that's brilliant, that's better than anyone has ever done. I'll let the great Carl Sandburg make my point. Sandburg says of the Gettysburg Address, No, Lincoln's achievement is to use newer phrasing and vocabulary with an older formal oratory. In other words, Lincoln is taking an old idea but having his own particular manner of expression. And this is why it's great. So, again, Lincoln's argument is ridiculous. He's saying you should come up with a new idea. No, there are no new ideas. There are only new manners of expression. This is the point I'm trying to make. Educate yourself. Question sources. Form opinions. Argue for your point of view. Maintain a flexible attitude that can't be threatened by others. But at the same time, and this is that difficult tension that you have to learn to balance, nurture your ability to grow and evolve in your own thinking. Be willing to amend your thinking. Like me at the beginning of the lecture. You know how I realized, look, if I'm going to really give a lecture on the Gettysburg Address, I can't go by what I saw on TV. I have to dig down. I have to look at sources. I have to come up with my own quality of thought, my own particular manner of expression. You have to do the same thing when you write. It doesn't matter if it's fiction or not. You have to question each of your thoughts and assumptions. You have to generate new expressions. How valuable is it? How much credibility does it have? And then you have to express it in your own way. These tools, Lincoln's use of time, use of imagery, abstract ideas, grounded in concrete ideas, a general expression of transcendence, and this is the big one. I've been throwing around that word transcendent. I've been saying this writing is great because it's transcendent. It's transcendent. Well, what do I mean? Transcendence happens in a piece of work when it somehow leaves behind the particulars of the moment, the day. And it transcends that time and that moment and becomes meaningful beyond that. How is the Gettysburg Address transcendent? Well, I'm going to read it to you a second time, like I promised. But before I do, I want to play a little game in your mind. I want you to imagine that I'm standing at Ground Zero in New York, where the World Trade Center used to be. I think that area is still smoking. So imagine I'm standing there, or President Bush is standing there, and he reads this speech. Listen to it in that context. Um, Eleven score and five years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that their nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what happened here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work that they have thus far so nobly carried on. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This speech still works. It's transcendent. It's a great piece of writing. <coughs> if you can learn to use these techniques that I've gone over and write every day, you will go a long way toward developing your own style. 
your own particular manner of expression. And with that, you can say anything and be heard. Thank you.